Welcome to the nation. I'm Nadia Abdul Latif. In 1954, a delegation to London that was led by Almarhum Tunku Abdul Rahman to seek the independence of Malaya proved unsuccessful. The British then were reluctant to grant the people independence, citing the excuse that evidence was needed to prove that the different races could come together as one and cooperate before independence could be obtained. But far from giving up, in 1955, Tunku and the Dream Team, including Tun Se Tan Cheng Lok and Tun Viti Sambantan, made a comeback trip to London, determined to negotiate Malayan independence that led to the Union Jack to be lowered at the stroke of midnight, 30th August 1957, at Padang Selangor Club, now known as Dataran Merdeka. That fateful Saturday morning of 31st August 1957, witnessed by 25,000 strong, the Malayan flag was raised and the proclamation of independence was read. How far we've come. Today I'm privileged to speak with Tunku Norkisina Petri, granddaughter of the first Prime Minister, Tunku Abdurrahman Putra Al Haj, as we remember Tunku and his contributions. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me here today, Nadia. I think just recollecting a lot of the things that have happened gives you goosebumps, right? It must have it been does. history in the making <laughs> and in so many ways. If that wasn't done, we won't be sitting here having this conversation today. That's true. No, so, I think to far off, it's just a, such a privilege to be born and you know, be his granddaughter. Definitely. And I think it comes with uh, both uh, a lot of responsibility as, as well as a lot of hope, right, to where we are going to be and where we aspire to become uh, as a nation. So let's maybe start with the man himself. Uh, we, we hear a lot and we read a lot in, in school books uh, and in documents and white papers about how he led the country. But what was he like as an individual? I know that you were born maybe two years after his past, but growing up, what was it like? What were the stories that you heard as a child growing up about Tunku? Well, it's, it's quite funny, right? Because I never met him and he was this highly influential figure in my life. Um, you know, especially when I was a teenager growing up young adult, I think every young adult would have this period of life where you try to find your identity. And being in England, where I studied for my undergraduate, um, you know, had me kind of going to Cambridge, literally going at front of his, uh, his, his college and just standing there and just wondering a whole lot of things. He was the reason why I studied law. I uh, law. <laughs> and I'm actually the third generation um, to have studied law and not become a lawyer. Right. So my mom did law as well. She didn't become a lawyer. So yeah, I'm kind of glad to kind of bring forward and continue the tradition of going to law school, not becoming a lawyer. <laughs> but I know too, <gasps> this must be the trend. We've got several prime ministers who've families either all lawyers or all doctors and and they do have this sort of legacy that was brought by either the patriarch or the matriarch whichever the the it's person true. was in the family but i think the good thing about having a law degree is you can pivot any which way right it's that analytical thinking that that is much needed so if we're thinking about that who in your family would you consider most like him and in, and in what way well i've always had and heard about how my brother his namesake actually mm -hmm. Um, is very much like him physically. He is as tall as my grandfather was. Uh, you know, he kind of has that really broad shoulders as well. And it's quite funny because he's literally the only one. And the same goes for my uncle, uh, Tunku Nirang, who yeah. is equally of height as my grandfather. But in terms of behavior, I think that's something that is hard for everyone to emulate because it's that thing where everyone that surrounded him looked to, looked to him as such a figure mm -hmm. that it's so hard to duplicate him as an individual, that sort of a thing. But obviously, you know, we all have um, my late uh, Nda Katija, who just passed away last week. Yeah. You know, she had a love for horses. Um, I have somehow grown to really like writing, which my mom says is very much a trait that is um, related to him. And I have recently really fallen in love with water sports and just being by the beach. So that's, I guess that's something that you know when they say in nature nurture yes. i guess it's kind of like a nurture thing that has grown or you could say it's nature as well <laughs> <laughs> but what was Tunku like when he was out of office you said water sports did Tunku take yes. to water sports as well well i knew he liked swimming and my mom would always have this story about how he would get on a boat and there was one time he would go around penang this is after he retired obviously mm -hmm. and my mom was about six or seven years old and they actually got stuck on like this not an island but like you know those like little rocks thingy that yes. would just pop up yes so 
they actually my mum remembered this story about how she she was like frantically trying to scoop up water and obviously you don't have like whatsapp you can't immediately <laughs> call someone back yes. then kan? so you had to wait for them and then it was this moment where she's like i'm sick am i going to die and it was just her scooping up so those are like some of the memories that i really grew up with mm. from my mum's stories about him it really felt like he was there and i think one of the things that most of us remember looking at clips of tunku rahman is his confidence right he has this aura when he goes around and even when he meets people when he talks to people it's not only the voice but his reassurance and i think reading a lot of his writing and i'm sure you've taken a lot of that too <laughs> his his sense of um love for that nation was so authentic it wasn't just you know uh, a specific race or supremacy he was really into the fact that if we are going to survive as a country we all had to come together um as one and and i think that really sort of set the stage as to how future um prime ministers that came after uh, really pushed for a diversified malaysia and we're going to get back to that in a bit sure. um but when you think about uh tunku and his time and his leadership not only about what he did but him and the team of leaders that were there basically our founding fathers and our founding mothers because yes. now we have to kind of cover both sides right yes. and they kind of struggle and i think it to me it's really humbling uh and perhaps that sense of nationality which or maybe patriotism that we don't feel as urgent as we do now actually i would kind of i would actually just disagree in that i think yeah. um patriotism and the love for the nation has taken on a different form mm-hmm. I mean over the, over the years especially in 1957 and now you know the priorities change yes. your external threats change I mean back then we had the you know threat of communism as well and we also had this pressure to form a nation and you know there's so many external factors and it's this thing about how even though history is you know it's, it's something old but you're always discovering something new and you're always forming new perspectives and new opinions because You also have this feed of knowledge that feeds into you yes. gradually as you grow older. Yes. So it's this thing about how my mom and I are always my parents and I actually would always talk about, you know, the nation and formations and politics and community society at the dining table and it's always this issue about how Malaysia is a teenager as a country. Yes it is. It were only yeah, we're it only is. 65. <laughs> no, that's considered young yeah, right? in comparison young. to a lot of other nations exactly. that are, you know, a, a lot older than us. But I think to reflect to what you were saying, I mean, on the one hand, perhaps the threat of insurgency or, or the threat of violence in comparison to some of our other neighboring countries are well, it's different from Malaysia. Yes. I think now one of the shared threats is how we're going to come out of the pandemic. And to to the point of what you were saying earlier, sometimes is that unified rallying cause that everybody has a role to play and everybody has a stake in this and everyone will lose if we don't do this together and i think covid is is a good example of that um what do you think are the three most important contributions your grandfather has done to the to the country and past why well i think it was more of him as an individual personality and the characters i mean the three personal personality traits that i think really appealed to me the most and really kind of attracted me when i was young was mm-hmm. how he was mostly very selfless mm-hmm. he had no ounce of greed um and he basically was just a very honest man i think one thing that i found quite moving and you know i'm still kind of trying to understand it is how he he went on tv he said oh you know under my premiership under my ruling as as a leader I would like to resign because that thing that we happened yeah. you know there are so many arguments as to oh you know what exactly happened intelligence reports accounts all these books and publications but not at one time did he try to point the blame and say hey, it wasn't me I wasn't around it was him mm. you know he was like whatever it is I'm the leader yeah and actually to add to that responsibility as well responsibility accountability and selflessness right to you yeah. to what you mentioned that yes also related True. Um and I think we're going to go dive into this a little bit more um and maybe reflect a little bit about what Tunku did not only during the Japanese occupation, the negotiation that he had with the communists, but we're going to take a quick break. Sure. And then when we come back, we're going to dig more uh, and speak to Tunku Nor Kisina Petri. Stay tuned. Menarik dalam franchise 3i minggu ini. Dan bermula 2016 daripada uh, Kemah ya yeah. and then uh, 6 bulan 7 bulan lepas tu baru kita nampak ada traction lah ada permintaan okay. kita tengok ada demand and then slowly kita tambah satu lagi dekat Ampang 
ada beberapa ketika kita berniaga tak ada keuntungan hmm. setelah itu kita down wife nak pergi buat check up tapi saya ada duit cukup-cukup saja -cukup RM200 je Franchise 3i Rabu 8.30 malam bernama TV Dulu kami panggil dia Mak Eng je Kawan-kawan biasa kan Mak Eng ya. Dia ada scrambler Scrambler uh, Yamaha scrambler Beliau muncul ketika ketidakstabilan Kisah ini adalah kisah seorang anak berada getah berjiwa besar yang sering menjadi pembakar jiwa anak bangsa yang kini bergelar Perdana Menteri Malaysia ke-9. Thank you for staying with us. We're talking to Tunku uh, Norkistina uh, and earlier we were talking about Tunku Abdul Rahman and how he was as an individual. Now, in Almarhum's memoir, Lest We Forget, in 1983, Tunku acknowledged the role of the communists and how they too played a role in the nation's independence. And I quote, just as Indonesia was fighting a bloody battle, so were the communists of Malaya who fought too for independence. Um, with the difference that the communists of Malaya were not the indigenous people of the country and were fighting to set up a communist regime. That being said, of course, the current administration, however, is reluctant to unlikely accord any recognition towards the communists, of course, because they had fought an armed insurgency for at least 35 years. Um, and I know that when we were talking about this prior to the interview and reflecting about how the relationship that Tunku Abdul Rahman had with all of these different leaders, it must have been you know, diplomacy at its height. Because on the one hand, we understood that the communists were also fighting for the country, but on very different terms. And Tunku was also very clear that he said even at that point, he knew that perhaps an Islamic state wasn't the way to go for Malaysia. And a communist state also wasn't a way to go for Malaysia. But perhaps growing up, could you share what was your thoughts growing up in a household that was so multiracial, that felt that in spite of all of the different beliefs that we had, irrespective of whether we were Malay, Chinese, Indian, Muslims, Sikh, Hindu, Christian, uh, this coming together as a nation was key if we're going to have a chance. And you too live in a very multicultural family, <laughs> so perhaps could you share a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, my grandfather married uh, my Chinese grandmother, and that was his second uh, Chinese wife. The mm -hmm. first was, uh, I think, Miriam Chong, who yes. he married initially, uh, and she passed on. I think, I think mean, Mintun Shafa Rodia uh, herself, you know, she was of a very mixed Arab uh, Malay heritage. It's, it's also that thing where I grew up. Um, in this household as well, where I would actually go and see Tun Shafa Rodia, and I remember her two nurses were Chinese. Mm -hmm. And you know, there was nothing wrong with having a Chinese caretaker. Yes. Um, and then I would remember we would meet uh, Uncle Mutu and family, and those were actually the drivers for my grandfather. You know, he was very intimate, very close, and s literally physically so close in a car in close space, right? Yeah. And to a certain extent, I mean, his life was in Uncle Mutu's hands. And not just that, but even my mom would always speak fondly of the bodyguard with the very long misai. I think there's a very famous picture <laughs> of Mr. him Pringle around. Mr. Pringle, right? Yes, exactly, <laughs> that one. Yeah. Uh, you know, he's just also passed on. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's that thing about how, like, when I was young, I was taught how these people were part of a household, part of mm. a family. Even though I didn't directly grow up with them, but my mom did. And the lessons that I got from my mom were so significant. I mean, I have my aunts who are adopted and they are Chinese mm -hmm. and I don't see that as a problem at all and that's what's something that I've really seen growing up. And I think in, in you know, prior to independence and all the way to the early days of independence, it was quite common to have multiracial BBs, right? Your nannies. Oh God, yes. So you would either have an amma or you would have, you know, an Indian family with a Chinese uh, BB. So it, w it was a common thing, it was a done thing. And I think a lot of the uh, guests that we've spoken to mm -hmm. um, on The Nation have also shared or regaled their, their you know, childhood memories of being raised by a different race. What are your thoughts about how that plays out today? What, what can we do better to kind of further push racial ties? Well, I think, I mean, I don't know. I just really feel like what I've seen, what I've come across, not just in the urban areas, but in the rural areas. So kind of a bit of a background context. My mom, my parents do a lot of work in places such as Klantan. Mm -hmm. We go a lot into the rural areas, into the village where, you know, we've been on like trucks and mm -hmm. it's like completely disconnected. 
And sometimes I feel like there is more unity that we see and that what we see through the headlines, through the news, what's being portrayed is completely different than what reality is. Mm -hmm. You know, and sometimes you go into a coffee shop and you sit among friends and you're like, hang on, wait a minute, you know, it's a very diverse and cultural being, very diverse in culture and climate environment. So it's, it's that paradox that I feel that comes across, you know, like I'm told in the news it's something different yes. with what the politicians say, yes. and yet what I'm seeing, experiencing is different. Could be biasness, but I think there's an appreciation towards how Malaysians themselves are naturally very united in a mm. sense, and if and when, they actually don't see races. I guess it's something that's external that's being pressured onto the community and society. I like that you mentioned that. So let's play devil's advocate for a while. Do you think <laughs> Do you think a lot of that is actually sort of media or propaganda that's actually pushing that there are tensions within the races today? Or is it a mixture of, yes, there is some truth in that, but I think there, there's also room for the, a reality check that we're actually more unified than, than what perhaps social media or whatever it is that, that's being fed to us are saying? Well, that's the thing, right? Whatever you said is completely true, but at the end of the day, it's also the role of social media in mm. actually um, hyper-focusing and kind of like even exaggerating and dramatizing certain events. You know, you see so many viral stories going around, mm. racial clashes where it's not even reality itself, right? Maybe also back in the day, we didn't have social media and that helped be get people more united. People don't kind of embrace this fear that's being told on them. You know, it's that sort of a thing. So, I mean, this is quite a slippery slope here for going, <laughs> but I think the most important thing is that you have a reality check upon yourself because mm. as a citizen of Malaysia, you're responsible for the unity of the country. And, you know, down the road, that is actually the peace of the country. And I think when, when you're reflecting about really thinking before you're sending something out, uh, fear mongering will always have a space. And as oh, we yes. know, fear always sells faster than hope. We always sells faster than than happiness. But if you think about you know the time that your grandfather was there in trying to negotiate uh, an independence without bloodshed, I think the role of media then was just as critical. Although it was yes. a very different place, there was no Twitter, there was no, no Facebook. Uh, but you know, reading about how the media plays a really important role in the political machinery, um, as well as in spreading propaganda from Hitler all the way down to where we're seeing today, I think it's really important for us to realize that whatever that we read, we probably need to kind of fact check and yes. ensure that it's absolutely true. Now, you said that you followed your mom, you know, to Sabah, Sarawak, to Borneo, to, you know, the rural areas of um, Malaysia and Kelantan to do a bit of work. So, could you share a little bit about that? And how much is that is inspired by the legacy of your grandfather? Very much so. So my mom currently heads uh, Perkim, mm -hmm. uh, an organization for uh, new Muslims. Mm -hmm. And this is actually founded by my grandfather after his retirement. So um, it's quite funny because one of the things that I would fondly always ask his, uh, his colleagues, you know, um, my granduncle Kurazali, who he worked very closely with for Smanga 46. Yeah. These are very much his last years. Um, and I remember sitting down with Tok Guli and I said, Tok Guli, you know, what are the things that you can tell me about my grandfather? This is when I was 21. And it's really trying to find myself, finding my identity. And he was like, he was a very religious man. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and I think that religiosity in himself, or rather his faith and belief in Iman and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was something that drove him and affected my mom because my mom would always tell me stories about how the reason why she goes into kampongs, makes house visits to all these people who are underprivileged, unfortunate, marginalized, um, the Orang Asis included, because she was so inspired. She saw that was something that my fa grandfather did. So for years and years and years, she got into a country, got into the rural areas of Klantan, mm -hmm. and then now she has found her own foundation in such a great memory of my grandfather and his work. And this also reflects back on the time when your grandfather was actually called back and his contributions during the Japanese occupation and how he actually helped the long houses and helped them to rebuild settlements and home despite the fact that there were so many things that were going on. And of course, the understanding of how, I suppose, from what we read in the history books now, mm -hmm. um, how our fellow Chinese families uh, and other races also suffered in the hands of the Japanese during the occupation yes. then. And I think that really brings about this sense of we're Malaysian first, right? Yeah. Uh, and it's really about humanity and about helping those that need the most um, in that point of time. Now we're going to go for a quick commercial break, but when we come back, uh, Tengku, let's talk about 
future ahead? Where do we see Malaysia and what are your hopes and aspirations for the country? So stay tuned. Okay. Pertandingan Sempena Sambutan Hari Kebangsaan dan Hari Malaysia 2022 Pertandingan Klik at Merdeka Pertandingan Bintang Patriotik Smule Pertandingan Bintang Patriotik Aspirasi Keluarga Malaysia Pertandingan Bintang Patriotik Rio Pertandingan mewarna dan melukis My Doodle at Merdeka. Pertandingan penyisahan kenegaraan. Pertandingan Ilham Merdeka TikTok Challenge. Saya Mbara, Sajak Merdeka 2022. Untuk maklumat lanjut, layari www.merdeka360.com. Thank you for staying with us. We're talking about Tunku Abdul Rahman and how charismatic he was. I am today with his equally charismatic granddaughter as we talk <laughs> about his life and his legacy. Okay, Tunku, so earlier we were talking about Tunku Abdul Rahman and his fellow leaders and how they fought hard for our independence. Now, if we were to dial back and we had that opportunity to ask him what he thought about Malaysia today, what do you think he would say for where we're at? <gasps> Gosh, let me just call him up. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I, I guess I can't speak for him, and I, I find that's like really dangerous trying to like put words in his mouth. Mm. But I think, as someone, I think we said this just now, where we need to have a reality check that we're such a young nation. Yep. I think sometimes people have quite unrealistic expectations of Malaysia. I mean, I think it's great that we get inspirations and take um, you know leadership cues and sense of direction from countries like the, you know, the U.S. Um, and even to a certain extent, Singapore and even the UK. But I think we have to realize that there are very many different factors that contribute to the building of a nation. Mm. And, you know, it's not always going to be the same. And we need to embrace the uniqueness itself and see that we can't just copy and paste things, right? Yeah, definitely. I love the fact that you said, let's, you know, take a look at perhaps some of the unrealistic expectations that we have. What, what do you think are some of the ex unrealistic expectations that we have? Well, Gosh, I think I have, you know, I, I grew up in KL and I've always thought, oh my God, yeah, you know, we should be more about like this, more westernized and this, that and that aspects. But as I was growing up, my parents brought me more and more into the rural areas of the country. And I always thought that, you know, old Klantan and stuff like that, despite being someone of a Klantanese heritage, um, where the Klantanese themselves would be quite you know, like hostile towards people who wasn't necessarily with a tudung and whatnot mm. that didn't look like them. But sometimes I felt like it was something that was quite different. And in fact, I remember this this kind of really echoed with how when Trump became president in 2016, and there was a lot of um, Democrat supporters that were very mean towards the, the Republicans because, oh, how could you have done this? But then again, people would just kind of step back and say, hang on. I thought it was all about embracing difference in, you know, difference in understanding and in theories and whatnot. And I think it's that thing about like, just because we don't agree with them, it doesn't mean that we can disrespect them. This is just someone coming from the urban areas to the rural areas itself. So yeah, I think it's also that thing about how like we need to respect the fact that Malaysia itself is has a space for those who have different views. Mm. And obviously, if it doesn't cross the extreme ends, then that's completely fine. But we need to make space for them to air their views, air their opinions out as well. And we need to start listening to them instead and of I just putting them down. I think listening more is definitely something that we have to master. And I think teenagers yes. don't listen very well, so no. we're, we're, we're getting there. So there are some clips that we want to show you about Tunku. Um, oh, nice. Does any of this resonate or perhaps uh, some thoughts? I, I believe these photos are from Finas. Yeah, this is actually in Makam Langa. And this is him, uh, I think, when graduating got to the bar. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I never got caught to the bar. <laughs> it's okay. I think you're contributing to the nation in many different ways. What about this one? Oh, I think this is, um, yeah, this is the elections itself when he was uh, in 1955, wasn't it? It was kind of that proof to the British that, you know, I can get everyone together and we can unite so that we are granted our independence.
So, Kisina, as we look at this, what is your hope for Malaysia moving forward, especially as we head towards independence? Well, this is the Merdeka Month, and this year the theme is Keluarga Malaysia Teguh Bersama. So what are your last thoughts on you know, your aspirations for the country moving forward? Well, unity is something that has always been a theme in every single year. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to stop expecting the leaders to actually show us what unity is. You know, we're all Malaysians, and I think the thing about being Malaysian is that you're not just Malaysian by birth, but also Malaysian by way of culture. There are Malaysians abroad who embrace the culture and have so much of patriotism. You know, I've seen so much of patriotism in those Malaysians living abroad. Mm. And I've also seen so much of patriotism in my friends who are actually descendants of Vietnam, you know, who, yes. people who lived in Pulau Bidong back when we offered Pulau Bidong as a safe haven for refugees from Vietnam during the war. And I think that's something that's important because we have to start realizing that we Malaysians are the residents of Malaysia. We contribute in many equal ways, you know, from the blue collar workers to the white collar workers, from the north, south, east, west, everywhere around Malaysia, even everywhere in the world. That's right. And, and I love the fact that you mentioned that being Malaysian doesn't necessarily mean you have to be physically in Malaysia yes. to love the country and to contribute. And I see we, we have a lot of Malaysians all across the world that are doing amazing things, not only for the country, but also for the world. And I think that's something that we should kind of um, take heed. Now, thank you so much uh, for joining me today. And fortunately, that's all the time that we have. But I want to close with some words of wisdom from your great-grandfather and he said we must each always think of Malaysia the nation's need first and least of ourselves everyone must try to help see that the people are one-minded with loyalty and one aim to make Malaysia the land we love a happy abode for all of us now if we can do this then we can guarantee liberty security prosperity and happiness for the future Take care and stay safe.